All right, so uh, I'm Christos Ifantidis. I'm this year's uh, Center for Academic Global Ophthalmology Fellow, and uh, I'm going to just uh, go over a couple of things with this talk. Uh, some of the residents already covered why we do what we do, um, so I'll skim through that. Um, mostly talking about my fellowship year, uh, what I learned, and why uh, the center is stronger for, for having the fellowship. Uh, as uh, Brent touched on, there's about 39 million people who suffer from blindness around the world. 80% of these uh, could be cured if they just had access to care. Uh, and unfortunately, 90% of them live uh, in poverty in the developing world. Um, the statistics on life expectancy are very bleak. 60% uh, of blind children die within a year, uh, and a blind adult will only live about two-thirds as long as somebody with sight in the same community. And this has a huge economic impact. For each blind person, two and a half other individuals are taken out of school or work in order to care for their blind relative. Um, so this is one of my favorite photos from the book Second Sons. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's a, it's a great read um, about the Himalayan Cataract Project. It, it documents how Jeff Tabin and Sanduk uh, Ruit met and their life story and, and the organization. And this is just uh, a young uh, Ruit uh, taking off the bandage of one of his Nepali patients and um, you know the excitement of the patient and the doctor. Um, and there's a quote from the book that briefly briefly read here. Uh, I watched staff nurses removing the bandages, and I saw the patients after their eyes adjusted to the tense, dim, carnival-colored light, searching for and finding the expect expectant faces of their families, where they leaned in from the tents many doors to watch the transformation. Witnessing so much unmitigated joy never loses its power. It felt no less humbling and true the 30th time than it, ha uh, that it had uh, felt the first morning in Rasua. If your hands were capable of such restoration, I wondered, wouldn't you be obliged to spend much of your life traveling to the world's worst pockets of blindness, too? Um, and uh, people have, over the years, have started covering um, the topic of global eye care. Um, this is actually a National Geographic cover from September, um, detailing C International and some of their efforts. And um, I'll, I'll touch on what they do in a bit. Um, there was a 60-minute segment on the Himalayan Cataract Project just a, a month or two ago that was also uh, pretty powerful. So it is um, uh, picking up popularity in, in the general media as well. Um, for the fellowship, uh, just an overview here. It's a year duration with six months of that being abroad, six months being here at Wills. Um, each year, uh, you know, this is the second year, there were uh, some similar locations, some different locations. For me, uh, I went to Ecuador, India, Haiti, Sierra Leone. Rwanda, Burundi, and Ethiopia. It's quite a few locations. Um, as uh, Priya had touched on, there was some issues with me going back to Haiti uh, because of the um, turmoil there. So I ended up staying in, in Africa and, and going to Rwanda and Burundi instead. Um, there were both personal objectives and objectives for uh, Will's Eye that um, I was trying to meet. Uh, for myself, I wanted to obtain a high proficiency in global surgical procedures, which basically just means being able to do a lot with very little, um, learning uh, M6 and, and other low resource techniques. Um, I also wanted to understand operations management with, uh, within the global arena in primary, secondary, and tertiary facilities. Um, and understand the educational systems for eye care providers around the world. A lot of times uh, it's different than it is here. You have people who are not ophthalmologists who are doing eye surgery in some parts of the world. Um, whether it's ethical or whether you believe in it or not, uh, it's there and I wanted to learn about that. Um, and uh, also looking at sustainable eye care models, Marta touched on that as well. Um, the trickle down or the sustainable model of, of uh, premium or pay for service versus free service uh, and sustainable eye care is really important, I think, in the developing world. Um, I wish Dr. Rao was here. Unfortunately, he's not here. But um, nobody does it better than the Indians. Um, and and uh, I think uh, looking at them as an example would really help us uh, improve our efforts. Uh, and they do a great job of providing exceptionally high level of care to everybody. And then, just as important, the local and economic uh, and uh, diplomatic impact, um, as one of the residents touched on it as well. Um, you know, sometimes we feel like uh, we're doing a good thing by going into place once a year, doing 200 cataracts and leaving. Um, but sometimes what we're leaving is a vacuum of care. Um, it's hard to find an ophthalmologist from that region who might want to practice there if they know that somebody's going to come once a year and, and take away um, their only source of revenue, um, even if they do want to help the impoverished population there. So um, understanding that was important. 
Uh, for the hospital, I wanted to strengthen the collaborations that we have worldwide. Um, there's a lot of them, and, and uh, uh, it's important to keep those growing and, and strengthening. Um, I wanted to improve uh, the training among the residents, fellows, and faculty, um, and that's really just a goal of, of the AGO in general. Um, the PR and fundraising efforts, you know, it's, it's uh, I think, a useful tool to show people what we do. Um, it's meaningful work, and people should really see what we do. Um, to develop the AGO's services to encourage visiting uh, faculty and scholars um, and try and get a back and forth uh, where we can get visitors to, to see what we do and then go back together. And that actually happened during my time here. Um, and then to progress the domestic efforts that we have. Um, so the first site uh, was Ecuador. And this is, uh, have a couple of pictures. Uh, if you'd like to buy any, you can just talk to me later. The proceeds will go to Will's Eye. Um, just kidding. Uh, so the first trip was with Heal the Children New Jersey. There was a couple of people from Wills with us, uh, Rich Tipperman, uh, Jake Lesnick, and Mark Goldberg. It was a week-long trip, and the objective was to do as much pediatric uh, and as adult cataracts as possible. It's really a, a trip geared for, for children, and uh, Jay was doing ptosis repairs. A couple of photos of the team here. Um, the majority were from the Mainline Surgical Center, a great team. Um, amazing things to watch what people can do when there's not a lot um, of resources. They were very innovative, and, and that was one of the reasons for, for uh, this year is to learn how to, to innovate. Um, here's Jay with some of the children he was uh, doing ptosis repair on, and a letter. My Spanish is uh, not great, but I'm pretty sure it says, thank you for everything to, the, to all the doctors. Um, and then, uh, so what I learned from that, this was a good trip because it was the only pediatric-centered trip, but it was important to see the type of uh, facilities and resources needed. It's, uh, pediatric care is a very resource-intensive uh, uh, thing, so I think for this sort of, uh, for, for pediatric care, uh, short trips can be effective. There was a pediatric ophthalmologist there from Cuba and working, as one of the other residents said, uh, on the ground with people. Um, who are there before and after, and, and Alessandro actually touched on that too, to take care of the people after the surgery was really important and to screen beforehand so it's not leaving that vacuum. Uh, sometimes there are ophthalmologists around the world, unlike here, where they just don't operate, um, and we can sort of uh, work together uh, to do the surgeries and, and then leave uh, with, with uh, a level of care there. I also learned that some cataracts should not be facoed. Um, this is a, a photo I like to call uh, Concerned Christos. Um, it's, uh, here's a close-up of my eyes. Um, this was one of the hardest uh, cataracts I've, I've ever tried to fake go through, and uh, it really just was a, a wake-up call to, to knowing that my next place to, to go to was India, where I would do the M6 training, and uh, how valuable it could be. This is a, the noisiest slide of the day, but um, it just has a couple of different studies here, the top one being uh, with David Chang and uh, Sandok Rui uh, in Nepal with a prospective trial in Nepal where uh, both had every possible uh, piece of equipment they wanted um, and they went head to head um, and uh, Ruit uh, did a tremendously good job. Um, David Chang did a, a, a good job too, but um, for the cost, it was about five times more expensive per surgery to do FACO versus M6. Uh, OR time was significantly less for M6, nine minutes versus 15 and a half minutes with David Chang. He's a premier surgeon in the United States. He's very fast, um, but he's no match for uh, Nepali cataracts. Um, and visual acuities, uncorrected and, and uh, corrected, were not significantly different. Um, the other three studies show similar things uh, in the hands of people who are both proficient in both FACO uh, and M6, such as at LV Prasad, where the residents, uh, the trainees, do tons of FACO, tons of M6. So on to the next place was India. Um, this was at LV Prasad Institute where uh, Dr. Rao uh, started, and, and, and uh, we wish him well as well. Um, I was there for seven weeks, and the objectives here were to do uh, my M6 training, and uh, during that time, you're we expected to do uh, a sort of subspecialty training as well. Um, they have an in-house uh, innovation center, which is uh, novel and new. It started about a year or two ago. And uh, I have a big interest in innovation, um, especially with uh, reaching um, the developing world. And so this was a perfect place. So I spent my extra time in that innovation center. And I made some great mentors and friends. Uh, on the bottom left here, uh, Dr. Varendra Sangwan is a pretty well-known cornea specialist um, who uh, I got very close with. And, and uh, he's a great 
mentor. Um, and on the right, uh, we have uh, Vipin Das, who is uh, an exceptionally talented young ophthalmologist who runs the technology sector at LV Prasad. He's the brainchild behind their AI movement with uh, um, Microsoft looking at uh, large volumes of data from India. I believe when all said and done, um, they're going to be looking at about 100 million exams a year from India alone, and they're expanding it uh, with Microsoft throughout the world and, and even in the United States. And hopefully, Wills can get involved with that as well. Um, one of the other projects, so I worked on the Microsoft project, and this is another Microsoft project in, in <coughs> conjunction with Scient. Um, looking at augmented reality um, in the realm of uh, ophthalmic education. Uh, I was asked not to delve too deeply into this topic, but um, they'll be talking about it. They're, they're releasing uh, the program next week, and I'd love to tell people about it, but it's really exciting stuff, and uh, India's an amazing place for innovation. Um, this is just some of the engineers that are in-house at LV Prasad. You basically can go from the clinic or the OR downstairs to the innovation center where there's just engineers working on different things and tell them an idea and work with them to, to find a solution. Um, it was really incredible. Um, I also had the for, uh, fortune to be invited by Help Me See to Mumbai. They flew me out there to check out this uh, um, um, simulator, uh, this hardware uh, and software simulator for M6 training. Their vision is to train M6 surgeons much faster than we do today to meet the growing demand for uh, blindness and uh, just really a great company. They have a, a lab in Mumbai and a lab in New York and um, hopefully I'll, I'll get to and, and Wills will get to continue working with them in the future. Um, one of the other things to mention during my time there, I submitted a video that I made with Varendra Sangwan uh, detailing his procedure, the simple limbal epithelial transplantation technique. Um, we did an instructional video and it ended up winning the grand prize for the AO's uh, global video contest. Um, the next step, uh, or the next uh, place was Haiti. Uh, this is a view uh, to work, or on, on my way to work, uh, uh, photo I took. Um, and this location was the Vision Plus Clinic. It was different than um, some of the other places. We, Wills has been to, to multiple different sites in Haiti. Brad's been to VPC. Um, and so this is in northern Haiti. Um, it's, it was in partnership with C International, which I'll talk about in a, in a sec, which is a great organization. It was two weeks long, and the objective here was over those two weeks to complete 150 surgeries, around 50 for me, um, 100 for uh, Dr. Dupuy, um, to strengthen our ties between VPC and Wills and our ties with C International, um, and to progress our plans for a Haitian fellowship. There is residency programs there, and we're trying to further their surgical skills afterwards. Uh, briefly, C International uh, is one of the organizations documented in Nat Geo. Uh, 450,000 people worldwide have had their site restored by C International over the years, uh, about 16,000 of these in 2015 alone. Um, they do surgery regardless of the ability to pay and have screened almost 4 million people over the years in 40 different countries, which is pretty incredible. Um, and they pair local ophthalmologists with uh, people from America and Europe and, and do skill transfers a lot of the times. So it's a great organization to work with. These are just some photos from the clinic. Uh, on the left, you see people either waiting for surgery or, or post-op care. And then on the right, uh, Dr. Dupuy, who's uh, quite a bit bigger than I am, um, waiting uh, to, uh, to go into surgery there. The next stop was uh, Sierra Leone. And, uh, this was another, uh, this was a new site for, for Wills. Um, it was with uh, Kathy Shanzer, who's a, an ophthalmologist in Tennessee, a great person. She's been going there for years, uh, about a month out of every year she spends there and, and supports a clinic. Um, the time frame was two weeks, uh, and the objective here was to further my M6 surgery, gain some independence, because she was an excellent FACO surgeon, high volume. Um, this was a chance for me to sort of uh, gain some independence with my own M6 surgery there, and then to do some skills transfers with the uh, cataract technicians who are there. Um, this is a, a picture of the team there with, with uh, Kathy and, and the uh, people from Sierra Leone. Um, this is a really uh, great organization because uh, it's not like she goes there only for a month out of the year and there's nothing there. She's actually built a, a year-round eye clinic there. So when she's not there, she has ophthalmic nurses, ophthalmic technicians, screening patients, all, not just over the country, but over about five different countries. Whenever we go there, or she goes there, people from about five different countries end up showing up. West Africa is a completely underserved area, and this was a really nice uh, 
thing to see, to see people, as you can see on the left, just, you know, flooding the, the city there. Um, they've done a lot for the town. They've built water wells, and, um, but, but the eye clinic itself employs a large portion of this village full-time full year-round. And on the right, you can see um, just some of the talks that I, I gave along the way about uh, different surgical procedures and, and working with the uh, cataract technicians there. Um, this is a picture, um, unfortunately, people are this blind. You know, they have to be carried in. They, they, uh, uh, if there's steps and everything, it takes a while, so they just hop on the backs of, of the volunteers who are helping us, and they get brought into the operating room, and, and uh, the next day they, they walk out, which is a really incredible thing. Uh, and some more patients postoperatively waiting there. Funny enough, uh, once I got back from Sierra Leone recently, I, was, I noticed a name that looked a little familiar and uh, spelling and the accent sounded familiar, and I asked where this gentleman was from. He happened to be from Sierra Leone. We got to talking, and it turns out that um, I had done his niece's cataract surgery only two months prior, halfway around the world. Um, so that was, that was a really great feeling, and he was very, yeah, very thankful um, for, his, uh, for, for the Will's Eye Hospital's efforts around the world and, and even in Philadelphia. Um, the next stop was Rwanda. This was at the Rwanda International Institute of Ophthalmology in Kigali. Um, this was an organization that started by uh, Dr. Siku and Dr. John. Um, time frame was about three weeks, and I think uh, John has spent some time here as well um, and in Utah. Um, but uh, anyway, so this was for three weeks. This was a different objective. This was to further some of our um, obje uh, our projects like Wheels on Wheels and our teleretinal screening programs there um, and work with uh, the accreditation guidelines for a residency. They're trying to start a residency there. So I spent a lot of my time trying to edit the accreditation guidelines and the um, residency curriculums to get them um, going with their uh, residency program. And the residency program will hopefully uh, include the Burundi site with John Cropsey, uh, who we'll talk about in a second, but uh, it's right next door and hopefully we can get uh, more communication and uh, interaction between the two sites. This was the Will's Eye Hospital uh, booth at the AAO, and uh, it's Brad, Siku, John, and myself um, taking a photo there, and then uh, John and myself in Rwanda. Um, it's always really nice to see people before you go there, and I'll, I'll, it happened in Ethiopia too, and it, I think it just s strengthens the bond a lot more. Um, there's a lot more trust when you see people in different locations. Uh, the, the relationship really builds. Um, on to Burundi. Uh, as we know, this is the site that John Cropsey um, has developed over the, over the years. Uh, this is also at the AAO with uh, Leslie Hyman, myself, Joe Bilson, Julia Haller, and, and John Cropsey on the right there. Uh, just an amazing human being. So <clears throat> this was at uh, Kubuye Hospital in Burundi. Um, and there's actually two Wills people there now. Uh, Daryl Baskin, who's a uh, Wills I Retina Fellow graduate, um, has joined John to uh, start a retina service there. Uh, he moved his wife and seven children uh, there, and uh, it's, uh, it's just really great. He's, he's also an extremely talented surgeon, and, and they're really taking great care of the people of Burundi. Um, so I was there for two weeks, and the obje objectives there were to evaluate the type of needs that Wills could fulfill at Kabuye, uh, look for international op opportunities for fellows and, and faculty there, and to develop the ties, like I said, between Rwanda and Burundi for uh, resident exchanges uh, from, from uh, Rwanda. Um, and also there were some ophthalmologists who uh, were from Burundi that ended up traveling to different places since they don't have a residency program like China and other, other sites where they get training but they don't do any uh, ophthalmology surgery. So um, we end up having a lot of ophthalmologists who are finding the clinic but have zero you know, surgical skills. And uh, it's like starting from day one with them. So I spent a lot of time working with them there. Here's a picture with John with the, with the uh, vehicle he picked me up at on the border. It, it calls it the old lady. Power steering is out, but uh, it still rides pretty smooth. Um, here's a picture on the, on the left here. We see um, a scope that they're uh, very proud of. Uh, Will's eye actually donated this scope. <laughs> Um, a huge deal. It's, it's the best microscope in Burundi. And uh, in order, since this is a wall-mounted scope, they built a gigantic steel frame um, to house it. So a lot of resources were put into uh, making sure that that frame was set up for, to be able to, uh, to house the scope. So um, there's, you know, they go through great lengths to make sure that every donation uh, gets used um, appropriately. And there's just some post-ops on the right um, during my time there. 
Uh, this is a video. Hopefully the audio will play. But this is a, a lady that uh, John uh, did a surgery on um, during one of our outreaches. We spent a, a couple of days going to an area in a different part of Burundi to do an outreach. And um, unfortunately, she had lost an eye uh, to a prior cataract surgery. So you already know it's a complicated surgery to begin with. Um, and so she was monocular and just was very afraid of uh, losing her other eye. So we had to convince her that you know, it was the right thing to do, that we could help her. And um, the risks uh, did not outweigh the benefits. So um, this is a video of that. Let's see if we can play this. Her first time seeing. Did she already get her vision checked? No. Mahoro! <laughs> That's her with John. She was ecstatic. She uh, um, couldn't stop crying. It was uh, pretty great. Um, here's Daryl uh, checking out one of his post ops, but again, just a, a great individual, and, and uh, uh, both Wills and Burundi are lucky to have him. Um, and again, uh, working with the skills transfer and the lecturing um, abroad with, with the uh, ophthalmologists there and, and the ophthalmic nurses and technicians, um, I think was a val really valuable experience for them and myself, too, to do, to do teaching like that. Um, the site uh, supports not just eyes, but a lot of other services. John's friends, actually, from medical school um, have all started uh, services there. So the Gen Surge, pediatrics, they're all American doctors who live in a community and take care of the people there. It's really phenomenal. And they do really good research, too. One of the Gen Surge uh, doctors just obtained a uh, $500,000 grant to, do, to build a program and do research there. Um, they have a food program that works with UNICEF to create uh, fortified uh, uh, grains for the community because there's not enough land per, per people there. It's, it's, it's completely overpopulated. So they're doing a lot for the community. Um, and so this is one of the photos from um, one of the uh, talks that, we, that John had to give at a church. So he gets invited to a lot of places to give talks. And this is one of the churches uh, that I went to with him and his family. And here's a, a little, uh, he'll probably kill me for showing this, but a little bit of dance moves by uh, John Cropsey. of John Cropsey, you can see here uh, behind that pillar, let's see, there he is. So, uh, but, but everybody, yeah, so everybody in the community really loves him. He's done a, a number of things. Uh, they really started to trust the hospital and, and uh, so uh, it's just really, you know, a, a great thing that we support uh, him and his cause. Um, this is his family, his three kids, Michael, Elise, and uh, Sammy. Um, spent a little bit of family time. I actually lived underneath in, in a guest house underneath them uh, for those two weeks. And uh, actually, yesterday I just saw on Facebook, uh, Jessica, the, uh, John's wife, uh, posted on Facebook that um, they're back. So I, I mean, they left yesterday. So I assume that they're uh, back in the US already, probably a bit jet lagged. But um, so he's going to be spending the next year back in the United States working at the University of Michigan. Um, and hopefully he'll be able to visit Philadelphia and talk about his amazing experiences. Uh, but just a, a great guy, and uh, he's very thankful for all the support that Wills gives. And um, I hope that uh, you know we continue to support him in his efforts. Uh, the last site that I went to uh, was Ethiopia, and this was with an organization, Himalayan Cataract Project. I'm sure we've all heard of it. Uh, this was the first time that Wills has worked with his organization. Uh, it was uh, for seven weeks, so about the longest trip that I was there. And the objectives were to visit two out of the three uh, residency programs and another site, the first HCP site in uh, Ethiopia in Quija, and uh, to provide educational sessions with the residents uh, to evaluate the needs and find opportunities for wills uh, in Ethiopia and join uh, a high volume outreach to see how they uh, organize um, tons of surgery in a short amount of time. Um, just a little bit about ophthalmology in Ethiopia. Um, huge need, huge need. So there are only three ophthalmology training programs with about two to six residents graduating per year. 
Um, no subspecialty level training in the country. And the WHO recommends for sub-Saharan Africa about <coughs> one to 250,000, or one ophthalmologist per 250,000 uh, people. Uh, Ethio Ethiopia is uh, at about one per 1 1.5 million. So uh, pretty stark there. Um, this is uh, just a chart showcasing what the lead cause of blindness and visual impairment is uh, in the country. Not surprisingly, cataracts make up the, the large majority of them. So 720,000 people uh, back in 2014 were blind by cataracts. Another 1.4 million were uh, visually impaired uh, with, lo with low vision from cataracts. Um, Here's a, a photo of just one of the educational sessions, the, the lectures that I was giving with the, the residents in Addis Ababa. Um, they're really pushing with HCP to standardize uh, the residency program educational curriculum, getting lectures, um, and doing testing. And so 41 residents during my time there sat for the ICO's annual uh, exam, which is similar to America's OCAPS, which is a phenomenal uh, jump from where they were 10 years ago. Here's some photos of just getting ready for the outreach. Um, so this was a pretty high volume outreach that we went to in the southern region of, of the north. Uh, the team there uh, takes quite a bit of, of effort setting people ahead of time, doing the screenings. Um, sometimes the, the outreaches can reach surgical volumes of 12 to 1,500 cataracts in a week. Um, so, so very high volume stuff. Um, this is the waiting room. Uh, it's outside, it's sunny, it's hot. Every, every piece of shade is, is taken up and, and people are spilling over everywhere just waiting to be seen, examined, pre-opt. Um, a couple of photos. Ethiopia is a very religious place and uh, uh, there's nuns and, and priests just hanging out everywhere. Um, but it's just, you know, it's a, a beautiful country um, with, uh, uh, the, you know, amazing clothing. Um, sorry, my phone was ringing. Um, Here's a, a picture again of pre-op and post-op, uh, just people waiting there. Um, and uh, some of our post-ops after the bandage has come off, pretty incredible stories. The guy on the left, it's kind of hard to see, but he could not stop crying after we took the, uh, the bandage off. Uh, his, his left eye um, was uh, lost to trauma, and so uh, he didn't have access, of care, access to care and was blind for about 15 to 20 years um, prior to his surgery. Um, and now he can see again. Uh, on the right, uh, a few of my favorite patients after, I've got a video of the, of the one on the left, she almost looks like she's trying to kiss the sun there, she's so happy. Um, she had bilateral surgery. And this is her after the, uh, the bandages come off. <laughs> And that was one of the uh, Peace Corps volunteers, actually, who, who came with us on the campaign. Um, so there's other NGOs that get involved with, with our outreaches there. Um, so just really grateful people. I wish this story was unique to her, but it's not. It's all over the place there, and they just live with blindness and kind of accept their fate. Uh, here's another one of my favorite patients who uh, basically was just accepted her fate that she was going to be blind until we convinced her that we could do something. Her family brought her in. Um, and she just kept telling us, even preoperatively, she's fine. There's no problem, even though she was clearly blind. People had to lead her around everywhere. And even after the surgery here, you can hear her talking about how fine she is, but we can see that she's not. This is right after surgery the next day. Uh, 
that's probably the coolest part of the day is uh, <clears throat> every, every morning after the patches come off. This was only half of the patients that we did that day before. Um, but uh, they, after the patches come off, it's, it's a sign of pure joy when they make that sound. So it's uh, pretty, pretty incredible uh, to hear that as a group. Um, so the next stop in Ethiopia was Jimma University. Uh, this is Dr. Sisai, who actually visited Wills. Um, he's uh, a fantastic uh, surgeon. We didn't, uh, you know, you never expect it because we don't see him operate here. But um, it was great to to meet him here. You really build the bond, and then you go. When I went there, it was almost like the. I mean, the relationship was started, and there's just a lot of trust there to begin with. Um, he's running the whole show there at this university, um, and just doing a great job, um, and could really. Uh, benefit from from Will's support for the residency program there going forward in the future, um, and this was the seventy sixers game at, uh, that we took him to during his time in Philadelphia. Steve Nades in the crowd here. Um, anyway, that's uh, Will's own cornea fellow with me there, um, and then uh, I paid a visit as well to uh, John Kempen, who um, actually was in Philadelphia at Penn for a while before. Uh, moving over to Mass Ioneer and, and following his dream of uh, starting an eye center in Ethiopia. Um, and so this is uh, the fledgling place that uh, is already showing a lot of promise in Addis Ababa. Um, on the left here, you can see uh, us taking a photo. And that uh, award on the, on the wall, actually, is uh, funding for the first glaucoma fellowship uh, in Ethiopia from New World Medical. Um, so they, uh, they're all with Scott Lawrence, who's also there, and he's a glaucoma specialist. So they're going to be training um, fellows there, hopefully starting pretty soon. But um, they're just, you know, after a long time planning, have been up and running for, for about half a year now. And um, it was, he's just a wonderful human um, doing great work there. And um, hopefully we can get more involved with, with his cause there as well. So overall, uh, for, for the center, um, I think this year has built a lot of uh, stronger relationships with uh, existing and new ones as well. So with the new relationships here, we have with the Himalayan Cataract Project, uh, Discovery Eye Center with John Kempen and Scott Lawrence, Kabuye with uh, uh, John Cropsey, uh, that, which is obviously stronger to begin with, but hopefully will only strengthen from, from here on out, um, the Southern Eye Clinic in Sierra Leone, and, and uh, a hospital in Ecuador, Francisco Rizzo Children's Hospital. Um, we strengthen relationships that we've had in the past with Alvi Prasad, which is a fantastic, um, you know, I, I look at it as the wills of, of the other side of the world, um, doing incredible stuff. Um, with VPC, which is another fantastic place to, to go and work and do skills exchange with. Um, and then uh, RIAO in Rwanda as well, working with them to launch their uh, residency program. Um, and it also, uh, you know, shows a worldwide recognition of Will's effort to improve quality of life, uh, not just at home, but across uh, borders and around the world. And I think that's really important to a lot of the centers we go to that know, our, know the name. Uh, personally, what did I learn? Uh, adaptation is crucial. Uh, you, you have to learn to do much more with much less. Uh, there's a lot of things wrong with this per picture on the left, uh, if you can tell. Um, it's kind of like those old highlights magazines, like uh, where you have to pick what's wrong with the, uh, the picture. Um, so this was uh, in Sierra Leone. Our cargo box was stuck in the port for six weeks prior to getting there because of uh, just, you know, import issues. Um, we had one light bulb working for two microscopes, which the math doesn't really work out for that. So uh, I had a flashlight, and we may do with what we have. And uh, it, it actually worked out OK. Um, but you know, we really, waiting on that, those supplies, we ran out of gowns. We ran out of um, the size of gloves you need. And, and so it just really causes you to uh, go out of your comfort zone and, and to uh, really adapt and do well, and, and that's just a box of instruments, pretty much all you need um, for the MSIC surgery, which is funny compared to what you see that you need for, for uh, FACO. So. Um, I learned that diplomacy was uh, really important to get a buy-in from the community. Uh, one of the most difficult parts is to get people to trust you, to come in and, and know that, you know, learn that you are trying to do, do well for them. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures on the left here, just a, a group of guys who I asked to smile, and clearly they uh, <laughs> were not having it. I, I guess that guy in the top left gave a little smirk, but um, they actually were really nice, and they ended up getting surgery from us and being happy with it. But um, smiling for photos uh, was definitely not um, in their agenda for the day. Um, and then you, you need to cross, you know, 
cultural barriers of all types. You know, we went to churches, we went to mosques. This is a picture on the right, um, giving a talk to the mosque, t you know, addressing the community, telling them that they were, were there for them, um, trying to provide care, trying to get them on a regular basis to, to spread awareness because some people just will stay blind in their homes for the rest of their life, even though somewhere close by could be care. So it's not just setting up the center, it's, it's the outreach portion of, of spreading awareness for that. Another good picture of uh, John Cropsey teaching a community how to play rock, paper, scissors, shoot, and uh, addressing the church that we visited uh, shortly before he started breaking it down on the dance floor. And then also just really rewarding relationships. Uh, I spent my birthday in Addis Ababa a couple of weeks ago, and just the friends that you meet along the way, um, you know, go out of your way to make sure that you're comfortable and doing the because you know you're out there doing the right thing. Um, they got me a birthday cake, we went to dinner, and you meet really cool people. That's uh, Jacqueline O'Banion here uh, down there who actually, Jackie is at Emory now and she's starting a global fellowship there too. And this year it will be their first one, so um, it's a growing community. And the picture on the right is um, my last night at LV Prasad in India going out to dinner. Those are all either engineers or ophthalmologists from nine different countries. You know, it's, it's truly a global experience. You, you build such strong relationships, and these are, um, you know, the people who are going to go back to their countries and, and hopefully uh, change reversible blindness um, for, for their country people. Um, I also learned uh, not to justify inequities. You know, a lot of times you hear people giving reasons for why, uh, giving reasons for why things are the way they are, that's fine, but you never want to justify it. Um, this field is not designed for individuals who can justify or rationalize the contrast. Uh, in eye care around the world or even within our borders. Um, so never settle for, for excuses. Um, and there's a pretty good quote from Fred Hollows, who's uh, an off who you know passed away but did a lot of good for international ophthalmology. Um, many politicians and anthropologists, it seems to me, deal in and accentuate the differences between people. Uh, I think it's more helpful and it certainly behooves a doctor to em uh, emphasize our common humanity, even if some people don't like to be reminded of their kinship with others. He, uh, he ruffled a lot of feathers during his time. Um, and uh, we all need to focus our efforts. You know, there's a thousand ways to do good um, that we think we're doing good, but the world doesn't really need 10 mission trips to 10 different places that only visit once a year. We need individuals to commit to a quality educational program or a group effort um, to educate the people uh, in maybe a few smaller locations. Um, and the overall goal, goal that we should always keep in mind is how we can make those places independent. Um, you know, the residents touched on whether it's colonialization or whatever you want to call it. Um, the overall goal should be to have an exit strategy and to be invited back as a colleague um, on in, and, and create an independent center that they can train their own there. That's the goal. Um, and most of all, to leave your comfort zone. This is uh, uh, a quote, again, from... Um, uh, second sons, uh, it's a Nepalese proverb. Uh, when facing two paths, if you are strong enough, always choose the hardest one. Um, this is uncomfortable, stressful, frustrating, difficult, and the most rewarding work you will ever do. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Howler and the Will's leadership and administration who supported the year. Um, during my time in Philadelphia, um, Robert Bailey, Mark Bleacher, Doug Wisner, Robert Bihar, and uh, Sidir Hanush for allowing me to sit with them and learn from them um, for the skills that I wanted to gain during my time in Philadelphia. And most of all, uh, to Alessandra and Brad, who uh, without them, the fellowship and, and organization wouldn't be possible. And uh, they're fantastic human, humans who are obviously capable of creating other fantastic humans. Um, <laughs> Uh, and just to let everybody know, as for me, um, my next step, I'll be going to the University of Colorado um, and uh, starting a global initiative there and, and working um, at Denver Health, which is a safety net hospital in the city, to continue you know, treating the people that, the patient population that I would like to treat. Um, but never fear, it's a, a small community of people who are crazy enough to do uh, global work, so I'm sure that we'll be collaborating a lot. and. Uh, Hopefully you'll be seeing more of me, uh, but thank you for all of your support.